This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Hey, welcome to Remarkable Results Radio. I'm your host, Carm Capriato, the pioneer of Automotive Aftermarket Podcast. You know, on a mission, you know, a mission always been to advance the aftermarket through the voices and the wisdom from inside our industry. Please recommend this podcast to appear. You must know someone who would be inspired by this message. This episode highlights Bill Haas's ASTE training class titled Advanced Financial Strategies for Peace of Mind. You go to bed at night with your head spinning, thinking about numbers, finance, profit, and stability? Well, Bill discusses simple financial tactics to ease that worry and stress. Stop hiding behind the phrase, I'm not a numbers person, and start taking control of your numbers. Thanks to our partners, Apex and Shopware, for providing this episode. Hey, Apex 2021 is in the record books now. I got to say, and I was there, that Apex lived up to presenting leading-edge technology from suppliers, but also a, a great job of showcasing the emerging technology of tomorrow. You've got plenty of time to plan for 2022, a year away, November 1st through the 3rd, 2022, Apex, now more than ever. Hey, when was the last time you heard a customer say, thanks for taking my money? Well, get Shopware's shop management software and your customers will be shouting it from the rooftops and overwhelming five-star reviews. And that's what you want. Learn more at GetShopware.com. Hey, don't forget to follow my Carm Capriato YouTube page for all archived videos and episodes. Now, let's jump into this episode with Bill Haas. Hey, warm welcome to my friend Bill Haas. Hi, Bill. Hey, Carm. How are you? Great, man. We're here at ASTE in North Carolina. Uh, boy, it's been two years since this event has been on. It's just, it's good to be back on the road. Isn't it great? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. It's so, uh, there's, there's a ton of emotion and memories about, you know, just coming out and seeing seeing the peoples. Yeah, uh, it's, right. it, it's so great. You know, you know, we spent some time last night just eating some pizza, talking to the guys and having so much fun. I'm sponsored here by, by Shopware, a great partner of the Remarkable Results Radio podcast. You're here doing some training. Doing some training. Glad to be back on the road, be yeah. in front of people and do some training. And, you know, so different than than doing the the Zoom kind of training. It's great to be back and get that energy and, yeah, and yeah. see faces. Virtual Bill. It's been. Virtual Bill, yeah. <laughs> Virtual Bill. Um, you're talking about, I mean, I'm fascinated with, with the title of your seminar, Advanced Financial Strategies for Peace of Mind. How many don't sleep at night? Well, I think a lot. You know, I mean, that that's really so prevalent, honestly, that there's, such a struggle for so many people. And, and it's a shame because they enjoy what they do. They just absolutely love what they do. And not only do they love what they do, they're really good at what they do. Yeah. And the, the difficult part is that you can enjoy what you do, be passionate about what you do, and then not be able to get a good night's sleep because you don't know how you're going to pay that bill. You don't know how you're going to make that tax deposit. You don't know how you're going to cover payroll on Friday. You know, this is what so many shop owners struggle with. And it, it's, you know, it's what I call successor struggle. Yeah. So when you do all the things right and you get paid what you should get paid, we know you're going to be successful. When you're missing that, then every day is a struggle. You know, I think about the drive home. <laughs> All of us have experienced this. I'm not talking to anybody and I'm, ex I'm not explaining anything that no one's done. It's five, six o'clock. Maybe you stay for another hour and think you're putting some papers together, dotting an eye, crossing a T, and then you get in the car. That time is supposed to be the wind down yes. time, right? And you're supposed yeah. to just decompress. You're supposed to listen to Carm's podcast on the way home and decompress, <laughs> get a new idea, network with <laughs> us. And you don't. We relive our day. We think about our struggle. I mean, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head with the word struggle. And then it, it continues into the evening, and then it wakes us up again at 2 o'clock in the morning. And then we get up and we're in the shower, and we're saying, oh, my, how am I going to fix this and that? And we never actually go and go to the well, I always call it. Go to the well and get some resources or stop and slow down and read or listen, talk to a coach, get in a networking group. And I don't know, I, I don't know what your, your training is about, but I think I may be nailing some stuff here. Well, this this particular class is really 
It's exactly what it says. It's financial strategies. Okay. And, uh, and yeah. so we start out with, what is it that you really need to pay attention to in your business? Okay. So it starts with KPIs and it's like, here are the, the numbers that you need to be watching. And you got to be doing this every day, every week. You can't wait till the end of the month. By the end of the month, it's too late. This has got to be looked at all the time. And it's got to be shared so that the people that are working for you understand what it is we're trying to accomplish here. Well, I think you know, he, I think you just said the biggest thing right there. Share. Oh, absolutely. You know, I I tell people all the time: if you don't share, they don't care. Now, think about that, mm-hmm. right? The people that are working for you, the people that make all this happen, the people that would help you if they knew. One, that you needed help. Two, if you were interested in help or that help was needed, right? Yeah. But that's what they're there for. But because we don't share, they just assume everything must be okay. If they don't tell me that, you know, we're not getting enough hours per repair order, we're not getting enough dollars per repair order, we're not getting enough parts, gross profit, percentage. If, if none of this is talked about, if the, then as the employee, I just assume assume well, we're doing pretty good. If we weren't doing pretty good, somebody would have said something. I love your points here. And I moderated a panel yesterday on uh, the, the diagnostic process. And one of the things that came out of it, if you're doing some testing and you're working with a flow chart and it says, okay, if this, if this value is this or this light is green, whatever, then you go over here. And they said, stop for a moment and ask yourself, why are they pushing you over there? Think about it from a financial position. Here I'm showing KPIs. We as ownerships need to be able to tell people why those numbers are important. Yeah. In this class, I share tools that I actually use with clients, that how we measure KPIs on a weekly basis, how we do cumulative totals over bigger periods of time. But within these tools, we have this built so that we can see what we would need to change in hours per repair order in order to hit our goals. Car count is always such a big discussion in our industry, right? We can talk about how we need more cars or we can listen to Bill and Bill says, you need to make the cars count more. (laughs) There's a difference. And and that's the secret. That's the secret sauce. (laughs) And and so again, in this tool, that's another piece that's built into the tool is we can actually look at car count. And know that quick if we have too many cars or not enough cars. It, it's really about the data, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, and I can't stress this enough. So many people I find in their businesses are making decisions with no data. And if we could just move everybody in the industry to making data-driven decisions, we would be a better place. Because then you remove the, the emotion and you remove the subjectivity and, you know, well, I talked to another shop, and he said he did this and increased his car count. What did that do to his hours per repair order? What did that do to his dollar? What did that do to productivity in the shop? How did that affect lost sales? Well, I don't know, but he, he did this, and it was a miracle because now he's got more cars. I'm not sure you fixed anything, or he fixed anything, or if you would do the same, that you would fix anything because you don't have enough data. So are you suggesting that there's just not one magic bullet here? There's not one magic bullet. You know, if you're really using the data, the data will help you understand what it is you need to work on, right? So if if I look at across sales, technician productivity in the shop, hours per repair order, sales per repair order, I, I may be in several of those categories not missing the target. So now I have to prioritize, right? What do What do I do first? Where's my... Where's my best opportunity to help this shop make a difference, right? And I think that's something that has to be stressed as well is people won't focus, right? This week, we're talking about car count. Next week, we're talking about hours per repair order. Next month, we're talking about parts gross profit. Instead of just understanding what it is I need to work on, what's most important, and focus on that and and stay on it until it is fixed, and then move on to the next thing, you know, that's strategic thinking, right? Okay. So I'm looking at all these numbers. Say that there's eight key critical KPIs that I'm I'm looking at, and one of them is out of whack. 
according to the world of whatever the, the benchmarks are, right? Sure. The benchmarks for the business, not for the industry. Correct. Okay. And I see something that, that's out of whack. How do me and my people know how to fix that? And if I do, will it affect another one? And it typically will affect another one, right? Here's the thing. If I can increase hours per repair order, then it's reasonable to understand that my sales per repair order will go up as well, right? Yeah. If I increase my hours per repair order, it's also reasonable to think that my technician productivity in the shop is going to increase. Right. Right. The one thing it won't affect is it won't affect parts gross profit <clears throat> probably. But but the point is you've got to understand that that's my opportunity. Working on that thing, making that my priority, which whichever category it is, you work on that. So to your question, how do they know what, what to fix? Well, they, they might have to ask somebody or they might have to stop long enough to do the analysis that they can find the answer. They'll, they'll, they'll know what the solution is, right? If I was a client of yours and we were working on this, would you have given me the, the crypt sheet that says, hey, if this isn't where it is, these are the, these are the fixes? I mean, because I think the people that are struggling, they're struggling because they don't know what's around the next corner. They don't know how to fix things. They don't probably don't know how to pull the team together and they've never shared the numbers. I mean, there's an awful lot of work that's needed to turn a shop that's losing money, can't grow market share, losing great people around. I'd love to just do a show with you on a case study of someone and realize the amount of time that's necessary. I, I hear from coaches in the industry that uh, give me three years, give yourself three years, you know, depending on how broke it is. And I don't mean broke as far as money broke, but just yeah. systems broke. Yeah, systems broke. <laughs> you, you agree with that three year thing or is it a little too long? I think that's long. I mean, I, I think to me, this is the critical thing that makes the difference. Would it take three years? Yeah, it'll take three years with that client. But find a client who said, I've had enough, no more, this is it, it's over, I am ready to change. It'll happen much faster. Part of the thing that we have to do as coaches isn't just show people what they need to change, it's to change them. <laughs> and and that's the, that's the yeah. thing that we work yeah. on first. The thing that we work on first is, is this somebody who's willing, they're not just saying they'll do it, are they really going to do it? And, you know, you see the difference, and, and everybody is different, right? There's, there's some people that, you know, it's just a struggle, and, and you keep fighting that fight. Like, I'm going to get there yeah. eventually, but it's, it's really up to them. Man in the mirror. And, you know, I, I always try to draw metaphors, and the, the metaphor is you wake up in the morning, pick a, pick a time, 6 o'clock in the morning, and you just you had your hour, hour and a half of you know, eyes wide open at two o'clock. Right. And you shower, walk back up to the mirror, look at the beard growth, the half sagging eyes. You're not getting enough sleep. You are struggling. Yes. Those are the moments that I wish I could get across to so many people that are struggling, get them up to be top shop operators. And to your point, if that person in the mirror doesn't say, I've had it, I'm done. I need to join a network. I, you know, people keep telling me, I got to do this and I got to do this and I got to do this. Or maybe I'm not even paying attention to the industry because I'm so deep into the s swirl of the tornado of my business. But to your point, I hear it from everybody. It starts with the leader. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Struggle. I read a book called The Rule of Holes. The, the premise is so simple. The, the book is summed up in this. The, the, the rule of holes is you have to know when to stop digging. And, 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 you know, the man in the mirror basically needs to say enough is enough and they need to do something about it. I'm not sure at that moment of impact that they say, I got to I got to fix this company. I got to fix me. I go back to Mitch's book, Misfire, and the, the, the parable that's inside of that book of the shop owner. The wife doesn't even know 
uh, how poorly he's doing the the money that you know he owns and it's really a construction company if you will mitch mitch, the the shop owner's the good guy and the construction company's not doing well but just put yourself in the same shoes as that guy and you and and you find yourself sometimes in it it's a great book to read to 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 have you if, if you're listening pick up mitch fire misfire from mitch snyder you may just find yourself in that book and realize draw a line in the sand yeah well, you know, and, and for a lot of people, shop owners, sometimes it's too late. You know, they're, they're really at the sunset of their career and they're thinking, well, what do I want to do now? I'd really like to retire. I'd really like to not have to come to work every day. I'd like to, well, you have to have something to sell. And you can't wait to start fixing this stuff till right before you're going to sell the business, you know, and, and this is something that we stress. I, I know I do. I know all the coaches do. We, we, you know, we work so hard at help, trying to get people to understand that if we're going to start working together now, we're working together to get us to the point where you have something to sell. Yeah. This, this has to be an investable business in order for you to put it on the market or, you know, are you just going to turn the key in the door for the last day and walk away and that's it. And that was, you know, or do you really have an opportunity, you know, to sell the business and see your legacy carry on? Well, I don't know. Some people are legacy people. Some people aren't. doesn't make any difference. But you want to be able to walk away and know that you and your family are going to be taken care of. And that was the fruits of your labor. Carm here. And coming up, Bill asks if you liked math in school. Find out why he wants to know. Carm here. Well, I can't say enough about the quality of instructors and the high level of technical and management training that was offered inside Repair Shop HQ during Apex 2021. Hey, it's in the record books, but the great news is that show organizers for Apex 2022 are hard at work again, assembling the best and the brightest instructors and the most timely and needed training for shop owners and technicians. And now watch for a robust schedule of training and product demos on topics such as engine performance diagnostic strategies, how to be an effective leader, wheel alignment and ADAS calibrations, controller area networks, and using social media to grow your business, just to name a few. With this caliber of training, make sure Apex 2022 is on your calendar. Now, that's November 1st through the 3rd in Las Vegas. And together, let's make 2022 the year of growing sales, profits, and productivity for your business. Listen here for more Apex 2022 training and registration information. I want to let you in on a little secret. Investing in a cloud-based shop management system could be the smartest purchase you make in 2021. Manual processes can really add up and cost your shop unnecessary time and money. Now, if you're writing out repair orders, you're wasting time. If you're chasing customers for approvals, you're wasting time. If you're manually calculating invoices or logging into multiple systems, you're wasting time. And if you're wasting time, well, then you're wasting money. Do me a favor, pull up Chrome, Safari, or whatever browser you use and type in GetShopware.com. Click on the Book a Demo button in the upper right corner and check out Shopware's amazingly efficient software. Trust me, you won't regret it. Again, that's GetShopware.com. I love where you went with this. I think of, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna paint a picture of the shop owner, male or female, says to their spouse, "This is our retirement, honey. This this is our nest egg." She may not know, he may not know that the business, you know, is making doing seven fifty, making two, you know, two percent that operating income, fifteen thousand dollars a year. Yeah. You can't do a lot of things to improve a great business at fifteen thousand dollars profit. You just can't. Right. And no matter how that number got there, if there's a lot of hidden stuff in there, it just doesn't matter. The fact is somebody's going to come by and buy that business that generates $15,000 a year. Oh, I got the $750,000 business. I'll sell it for a million bucks, baby. We got it. Yeah. And then the reality sets in. We just did a show recently on this. And, and to your point, that was really cast inside the show is that if, if you're struggling now, you're going to struggle big time trying to sell it. Yeah. You know, so back to the class, we go through the, all the KPI stuff and, you know, we help them understand that there are tools to help them 
realize the things they need to change in order to improve the business. And then we go, then we go to the, the difficult part, right? Then we go to the profit and loss statement. What's that? Yeah, what's that? That's kind of the, the question you get or the, the, the response you get from, from some people. I've you know? seen that. I, I've kind of scanned it. I, I don't agree with the net profit number. Come on, that can't be right. I'm working so hard. Well, you know, and that happens a lot because they believe that they're working hard, they're doing a good job, their sales numbers are good. In, in fact, sometimes they'll even go so far as to ask their accountant, how, how are we doing? And the accountant goes, man, you're having a good year. You're doing well. You're, I actually have an example that, that I use in the class where this was actually a shop that asked me to, to come. They didn't understand why they had no money. You know, and the conversation was kind of like, Bill, could you come and just look at this for us? I just don't understand why we don't have any money. And yet when I talked to the accountant, the accountant says, your P&Ls look good. You're having a great year. And, you know, this is into like September, October, probably getting getting into the latter part of the year. And, you know, so I go and, you know, start to do some analysis of their P&Ls and start to, to ask a few questions. And they're showing a not a great net profit, but a reasonable net profit. But as I'm doing the analysis of the, the profit and loss statement, there's some things that are obvious that, how are you paying yourself? Oh, well, you know, I'm an LLC, so I do a member's draw. Well, that's not on your P&L. That's on your balance sheet. So all the money that's being shown on your P&L as net profit is actually your salary. And so as soon as you pay yourself, if you would recognize that member's distribution as the owner's salary, you actually go from a reasonable, not great net profit to no net profit. Mm -hmm. Do you really think your accountant's helping you? And this is not, a, believe me, this is not a knock on accountants. Right. Okay. Nobody should be using their accountant to try and understand how well we're doing in business. Casting that P&L against other businesses that the accountant may know, saying you're doing really great. It's not helping. Well, and that's one of the things that we stress when we talk about accountants, right, is don't rely on your accountant to help you in your business in terms of how are we doing or what could we change or where could we do better? Because they don't know. They're just numbers people <laughs> and they don't understand your business. They don't understand our industry. If you think about it, the, the typical accountant, unless you find accountants that specialize in, and there are some and there's oh, some yeah. really good ones, right? <clears throat> oh, you, yeah. you and I know a guy who's absolutely dialed right into yep. if you own an automotive repair shop these are things that's not the typical accountant the typical accountant has you know clients that are auto repair shops dry cleaners bakeries right and oh, so yeah. he doesn't know any of those no. industries very well but but he understands the numbers he understands balance sheets and profit and loss and he says hey well, how can i do to fix my business well you need to cut costs over here he may not be talking about how to improve gross margin, how to improve the KPIs. He did, probably doesn't even know what a KPI of our industry is. No, he doesn't. You know, and, and so I like to apply this rule to accountants. If you have an accountant who's not a specialist in the automotive industry, doesn't really have an in-depth understanding of our industry, then my rule is this. Your accountant's job is to minimize your tax liability. Nothing else. Yeah. Don't ask him anything else. Don't expect anything else. He prepares your taxes, and his sole job is to minimize your tax liability. That's it. And if he does that, then he'll be worth everything that you pay him or her. Makes sense. This isn't the first time you've given the class. No, it's it's not. We've, you know, this class has been done many times. It's through multiple iterations, you know. So we do the P&L thing. We spend a lot of time in that. We look at very specific areas of the P&L to help businesses understand that things are categorized correctly and they understand what the revenue streams are, where their expenses are, what net profit is and, you know, what net profit is used for and why you have to have net profit. And, and we go into, you know, we go into how do we pay people? We, you know, technician pay is such a big thing. So we actually spend a lot of time with technician pay because that's a financial strategy in your business. Sure if that's is. not yeah. doing being done well, 
you're going to have other problems, right? So, you know, we, we really just covered the gamut of all the things that they should be looking at and being able to identify what, how, how do you identify the areas that are opportunities to help us improve. So what's the reaction at the end of the class? Do, do any lights go on for people? How, how, share with me the people that come up to you at the end. I mean, I've done seminars before and you, you work hard. You think you got good content. You're looking at eye contact. You're answer, you're asking questions. You're, you know, today you can't go out into the audience right. in this pandemic thing. But when people come up to you at the end, what's the feedback? Did you open any, you know, turn on any eyes? Yeah, I, I think so. You know, generally the feedback when, when people are coming up after the class is, I never looked at things that way. I never understood that that was something we needed to do. You know, a lot of times the reaction is just that, it was different. Nobody's ever presented it this way before. And 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 it's not complicated. I mean, honestly, you know, I, I try to keep it really simple because this here's what I believe is is part of the difficulty for a lot of people is when it comes to the finances in your business, it's math. It's that, math. Yeah, that's all it is. It's all it is. I mean, if you think the reality of, of the stuff that we do when we do the the business analysis worksheet, you know, that I'll use with, with clients is it's just a big math problem. It's all it is, is a big math problem. And so here is the difficulty for most of those people. Were they good math students? Did they enjoy math? You said, put yourself in front of a room of 50 people and say, you know, who enjoys math? <laughs> Not many hands are going up. Okay. Thank you for reminding me of fifth grade. We were, I can't remember what kind of math we were doing in fifth grade, but our family business was two doors over from the elementary school. Okay. And of course, everybody knew the family had a business and the math teacher went to me and he goes, you keep it up like this, your dad's going to be really disappointed. You're <laughs> never going to be able to run that business. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Thank you for reminding me. Well, but you know, and, and that's just the reality of what we deal with, right? What do you like to do? I like to fix cars. Do you like math? Oh, no. Well, there's a lot of math in fixing cars. Yeah, but I memorized that part. Okay. <laughs> so now let's talk about running the business because now there's a lot of math involved in, you know, I don't like that, you know, where are your P&Ls? And they bring you a stack of manila envelopes that have never been opened, right? And it's like... <laughs> Do you know what's inside the envelope? Receipts. I don't know, but the accountant drops it off every month and thinks I should have it. It's like, no. Uh, let me break the code here on uh, return of sales, uh, the, the percentages. Uh, I, when, when I, that broke for me as, as a young business person to look at uh, marketing as a percent of sales, mm -hmm. not the number as much as, you know, it, oh, wow, $42,000, I'm spending too much money. Right. That's, well, I got to cut my, well, look across, it's 3%. The industry says five. Right. And so I think, in my opinion, you got good KPIs on car counts and all this. I think the KPIs of the percent of sales of every expense category Absolutely. is really important. It is. And I, I see, I've seen P and L's before that don't have that percentage column. They don't even have a, it, it, let alone, let's not talk about budgets because <laughs> I think very few P and L's have those percentages. on. That's them. my point. It, it, it's a, it's a really simple, very white piece of right. paper with numbers and a net profit on the bottom. And you look at the, it, it goes back to the why or how do I fix it? And if you say, well, listen, the category of, Shop towels and laundry could be way out of whack. It, right. it could be it could be a a number you overlook, but as a percent of sales, it's higher than industry standards or a budget that you'd like to set. So where do you go through and okay, you work on sales, you work on margin, you you work on costs, yeah. and they each have their own strategies on how to manage. Yeah, and the other thing you know in this class is is we talk about setting your labor rate which gets to be a really interesting conversation because there we we actually look at three different ways to understand if your labor rate is correct or not we look at it as gross profit percent on labor because we know what your labor cost is yeah. okay so we can do that and we can dial it right in we can look at 
labor parts split in terms of the percentage of revenue coming from labor versus what's coming from parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a red flag right away that, that most shops will miss is if your part sales are higher than your labor sales, there's something wrong here. Okay. And so we can do that calculation for them. We can do the hours per repair order calculation of improving that, what your labor rate would need to be. So, you know, we give not, not only do we talk about labor rate in terms of is it correct and what do you need to do to improve it? We give you multiple ways of looking at it. And when it's really incorrect, what you'll find out is they're all in sync. There's not, there's not one calculation that says, well, it seems to be okay here. And the other two are saying, no, it, it's not, you know. Uh, and help me explain, explain that a little deeper. The, well, the, the, you mean be, the, the bad numbers are in sync? The opportunity is in sync. You know, whether you want to say, I'm going to increase my labor sales or I'm going to increase just the labor rate as a number or I'm going to increase hours per They all have to happen, you're saying. And they're in sync. Okay. Right? It's not like one says, hey, everything seems to be okay, but the other two are saying, pay attention to this, there's something wrong. It's not. But And the reason for that, what I want to, what I want to share with you, the reason for that is you will always find the shop owner that when you show them something that would make a difference, the change that they would need to implement, they will always come back with another thing that says, yeah, but this is okay. So I, I'm not sure you're right. So when you start laying all that out for them, you've covered all the objections. How much resistance do you get from trying to implement, you know, KPI management at clients? You don't get a lot of resistance. You get the challenge with the KPI thing, and, and I use this all the time, is they look at it as a report card. It's like, oh. well, I, I, I put in the numbers, so there it is. I say, I put in the numbers and I sent it to you. It's like, you're not doing this for me. Yeah. This is not yeah. a report card yeah. to be <laughs> graded by Bill to say, well, yeah, you I did, that, you know, yeah. you get an A this week or a B this week or a F this week. I mean, that's, that's not. All right, Bill, tell me how I did. Yeah. And it's, you're, you're right. It's, it's not about you. It's about them. It's about the client. It's about does, right. he re, does he or she really, really want to do this? You're the one, as the shop owner, you're the one that has to be putting the data in to realize, wow, I see a trend here. Or, you know, Bill keeps talking about this and he's right. It, it's the same thing over and over. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But if they're not doing that, if they're not engaged to that point of, participating and being the person that actually, you know, don't sit down Monday morning and put the numbers in and, and, you know, send it off and we're done. It's like, when you're doing this, take the time to reflect on what actually happened last week and what are the things that happened last week that are reflected in these numbers that you're looking at on Monday morning. I go back to how do I fix it, and, and to me, I think when when somebody says to anyone, I don't care if it's to a business coach, they say it to a peer, how do I fix this? Yeah. I think that gets them over the line, doesn't it? I think so. I, I think they feel like because I'm making the effort, you know, because I'm now talking about it, that that's going to make it, it better. But there's a lot of hard work to do, you know. The last part of the class... I'll share this with you that, that, you know, most shops never talk about is we do sales forecasting and budgeting. Ouch. Yeah. Because it's like, well, I don't know what sales will be. Well, you have to have goals. You need to have targets. You need, how do you, you know, how do you expect your people to perform if you don't create the expectation? How do you perform if you don't know what's expected of you? Right. So we actually and, and, you know, we go through this in the, the class. We actually have a worksheet that we use that sets up sales forecasting and says, well, this is what we should be able to do in the next 12 months. This is what we should be able to do. And then we set up a budget and break down by category what's being spent in each category, going back to what you mentioned a moment ago, looking at the percentage of that. So when we're looking at advertising, we're not looking at the dollars we're going to spend every month. We're looking at what's that percentage of sales. So based on our sales forecast, if our revenue is going to be this and we're going to spend this to market, what is that percentage, you know, and and do that in a number of very specific categories. Right. 
it's kind of interesting when you get about halfway through the year and things aren't going quite as they expected. And then you go back to the sales forecast and the budget worksheet and you go, well, let's look at where we're at today compared to where you said you were going to be. What's all this money you're spending? None of that was in the budget. Oh, yeah, but, you know, I wanted that thing. You know, the, the, the guy came, and it's the greatest, it's the best, it's, you know. and I had a weak moment. Yeah, you know, and it's <laughs> like, are, are you an auto repair shop or an adult toy box? I mean, what is it, right? I think the forecasting and the budgeting are really critical. I, I spent 15 years in, in that world, you know, in corporate America, projecting yeah. based on, trends based on the previous year, based on the goals you had to have. Hey, listen, everybody wants a raise. We need to buy some new equipment. Yeah. All of that stuff has to be figured in growing the business yeah. from all all categories, all points of view. And, oh, it's one more thing I have to worry about, Bill. I mean, yeah. are you kidding? You're killing me. <laughs> well, it does get tough for, you know, it, it does, does get no, it tough. Does. It does get difficult sometimes. Way out of the comfort zone, just yeah. completely out of the comfort zone. But sooner or later, as the business owner works on their business and not in it, they have to take on these new roles and new responsibilities. And, you know, I, th I believe having a business coach with them during this, if you will, transition, hey, just hire me for three years. Let me get you up and out. Yeah. Let me get you prepared to sell. Yeah. Let me, let, you know, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about that. And, sure. and, and, and here's, and, and the really cool thing about m many of the shows uh, that we do is that don't worry, we, we can get you there. Now, if you're, you're 70 and you waited too long, you know, maybe the next three years, maybe you don't have the energy or whatever yeah. uh, to do it. You have no internal candidates. You have to go on the outside. You may not get what you want, but start. And then the story goes, is all these 30-something and 40-something shop owners that are involved in the industry, that are here at ASTE, that are in networking groups, that have coaches, they're going to be, you know, Help 55, they'll sell and start a second career and do well. Sure. I have to thank you for what you do. You do such a great job. The, your role in the industry, we couldn't do it without you. You have done such a phenomenal job of sharing and helping people know that there's help. You know, just listen to Carm's podcast. Just pay attention and listen, yeah. and those nuggets are out there. So I, thank I, you for what you do. Thank you. I, you know, I call this kind of a private networking group, be a fly on the wall. I mean, how many people have a chance to just hover and hang out? And you know, how about the people in your class? They're going to leave and say, I need more of Bill. This was great. We hope so. So go we to my website, so. <laughs> go to my website, type in Bill Haas and listen to them all. <laughs> I should have done the math, but we've done a lot together. We have done a lot together. You, you've been thank so, you willing, for that. so willing to share. And, and I love your insights and your ideas and, uh, you know. You've been around the horn. You're a wise guy. So a wise guy. No, no, I didn't mean it like that. Not New Jersey wise well, I guy. Think, I think some people would go either way with that. <laughs> Super to have you here. Bill Haas from Haas Performance Consulting. You know, we, we pulled you out of your class to, to do this show. And man, I sure do appreciate it, my friend. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time. 